Hey everybody, what's up? It's Chase. I want to welcome you to another episode of the Chase Travis Live Show here on Creative Live. You know this show, this is where I sit down with the world's top creators, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders, and I do everything I can to unpack their brains with the goal of helping you live your dreams in career, in hobby, and in life. We are broadcasting live here to a global audience, so uh, if you're in the comments on whatever platform you're watching, whether it's YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Twitter Live, Instagram Live, or my favorite, which is creativelive.com slash TV. Let us know where you're coming in from, and I will do my best to let your questions and comments um, affect the trajectory of the show. If you've got questions for our guests, I wanna know about them, um, and that is a way, again, for you to shape the show and be a part of our conversation today, which, as we all know, is it's fun to be connected in a global way. And uh, I will stop talking here and get to the get to the business because I know you're not here for me. I know you're here for our guest today. And our guest, John Mackey, is the CEO and co-founder of Whole Foods Market. He's also the co-founder of the nonprofit Conscious Capitalism, the co-author of Conscious Capitalism, and most recently, one of the things we're going to be over-indexing on today, Conscious Leadership, Elevating Humanity Through Business, his new book. He's devoted his life to selling natural or organic foods, one of the first places in our country where we really saw organic foods hit scale um, was at Whole Foods, and, and he wants to build a better business model. Um, September, this particular month of 2020, marks the 40th anniversary of opening the very first Whole Foods market. Please give a warm, creative live welcome. Tap on the keys, raise the roof, smiley faces, whatever you do out there on the internet, and welcome John to the show. John, thanks for being a guest today. Thanks, Chase. Glad to be here. I'm uh, very excited. I have the good fortune of getting an early copy of um, of the book and in a PDF form. And I want to say congratulations. Great, great accomplishment. And if we need anything right now, dear God, we need leadership. So I don't know if this is the way books work. You've been working on it for a couple of years. Was yeah. this some some vision that you had of needing to change the trajectory of our leadership, or why <laughs> why leadership? Well. We, the, when we published Conscious Capitalism back in 2013, so seven years ago, but um, the two chapters we wrote on conscious leadership got a lot of feedback. Leaders wanted, they wanted more of that. They wanted, uh, they, they wanted to be more conscious leaders themselves. They wanted more direction on how to do that. So it was kind of the next book that was kind of up that I felt like I needed to write. It's kind of a happy accident that it's being published at a time right now when we're in a in a very divided society and the idea of more conscious leaders is it's very timely in that sense but that's that's just fortunate on our on our part well uh, as the saying goes rather to be lucky than good that's perfect timing and you happen to be good already so um congrats the the thing that i've always appreciated about um all of the I've, we've never spent time together before but you know, I've read your previous work and what I've always admired about Whole Foods uh, and um, basically your work over 40 years. We just, as I acknowledged in the intro there, 40 years since the first store opened is this understanding of purpose and the crowd that's watching and listening to this right now. And I'm seeing comments coming in from all over the world. Um, I'll recognize a few of you out there in the world. We've got a seven or nine countries already tuned in, but is the, the folks who are listening are creators and entrepreneurs and in part they are free spirited and they're individuals and purpose is a really, really important um, concept for them. But I'm hoping you can help us understand what your purpose was in starting Whole Foods and maybe through um, understanding the way it worked for you, we might, um, inspire some folks to, to take that uh, to heart for themselves? Sure. Let me maybe just give kind of the origin story of the company. And that'll, Love it. That, that'll talk about how I found my own purpose in life and with the business. So back when I was about 23 years old, I moved into this vegetarian co-op in Austin, Texas. And I was a student at the University of Texas, uh, studying philosophy and religion and basically humanities in general. Got 120 hours of electives, no degree. I just took what I, the classes I wanted to take. I moved into this vegetarian co-op. I wasn't a vegetarian, but I was very interested in all things counterculture. This is back in the middle 1970s. And um, 
I thought I'd meet really cool people in a vegetarian co-op, and I did. I met I met my girlfriend that I co-founded the uh, the business with, and uh, I I had my food awakening because I did become a vegetarian, and I learned about natural and organic foods, and I got really excited about them. The more I I learned about them, the more excited I got. I became the food buyer for the co-op. Then I went to work for a small natural food store and learned the retailing business. And I remember coming home to the co-op one evening and just talking to my girlfriend. And I said, I had this crazy idea today. Renee, what do you think if you and I opened up our own store? And I don't know how my life might have been different if Renee had said, no, I don't want to do that. It's a terrible idea. Instead, she got super excited about it. And we, we launched on that adventure. And we opened up the first store. It was called Safer Way. It was a very pure store. It had, it was vegetarian, and it, it had no. We didn't sell alcohol or caffeine or sugar or white flour. We were just very, very pure, and we did almost no business. And we we had a vegetarian store, and we had a vegetarian cafe. And then we, Renee and I moved out of the co-op, and we moved in and lived on the third floor of the uh, of the store. Very romantic, good part of my youth but learned a valuable lesson. And then I had my food awakening, safer way, struggled. But when we decided to relocate it and we merged with another store, changed the name to Whole Foods Market, and we hit the sweet spot. That store, the first Whole Foods Market just literally took off. It exploded, became the highest volume natural food store in the United States. And so people asked me if I had this grand design, whether I had this purpose. No, I followed my passion. I had this awakening about food, and in that awakening and in that discovery, I found purpose. This was something I really wanted to do, So, and the more I did it, the more I learned, the more excited I got, and one store led to two because we had a flood that wiped us out, but we rebuilt, and we said, we got to do a second store, so this will never risk wiping us out again, and that was successful, then we opened a third store. Uh, we raised venture capital money. Then we went out of Texas into California, into Palo Alto, and and Whole Foods just sort of took off like a like a Roman candle or a rocket ship. It just really it really launched, and we we made a lot of mistakes, but we learned. It's very I think back on those early days with a great deal of nostalgia, partly because I was super young and uh, I was having a time of my life. But the purpose came from following my passion. Passion led to purpose, and then purpose is what I realized. If I could get people as excited about Whole Foods as I was, if I could instill that purpose in the people that work there, then the success of the business would be guaranteed, and I, I was pretty good at doing that. Well, I'm fascinated by um, a particular aspect of what you said, and, and I've seen it over and over in our community. I have experienced this myself, and it was clearly a piece for you, which is – you didn't figure out that that passion and the next steps from sitting on the couch and intellectualizing them. It was literally required that you took some action, right? You went and did this other work and you came back to, was it Renee? Right. And said, let's do this thing. It didn't come like I have an idea for this thing. It's like it really, as you said, your purpose unfolded from taking steps. And I don't know if that you know defines an entrepreneur someone who's willing to take the risk or if that and it seems to me that this is available to everyone how did you understand that passion because right now there's someone sitting in their underwear in ohio watching us stream this <laughs> and they're wondering like boy i want some of that juice that sounds great but how i mean i'm passionate about so many things i like chocolate cake and macaroni and cheese and i like you know cutting people's hair and I, I like, you know, they have 10 things. How did you narrow it down? And was it obvious to you or did you run some sort of analysis? How'd you underscore on? I was maybe 20 at that time. We were very young and it was just an adventure. We didn't think about risk. We, we weren't doing a risk benefit, cost benefit analysis or study master plan. I was just excited and I went for it. Um, and I will tell you, it's good to go for it in life. If you, you know, it fortune favors the bold, make, do things, make a commitment, take a chance. And I, I don't even think of taking a chance. Just follow your heart, do what you care about. And, uh, it'll probably work out for you. And if it doesn't, you'll still learn a lot of lessons along the way and you'll be a wiser human being. 
this idea of taking a leap, I think it's a little bit blown out of proportion. Um, Richard Branson, investor in Creative Live, longtime friend, and, and also been on the show, he's gone on record saying very clearly, like this belief that you have to like get a second mortgage on your house and do all these things in order to to become an entrepreneur or to experience experiment or to follow your passion or follow your heart. That's that's a narrative that's just sexy in the media. But most of the entrepreneurs that that I know, again, speaking from Richard here, are ones that have just taken a chance, as you said, gone on an adventure. And it you didn't have to see all of the staircase. You just have to see this, the, the stairs that are in front of you right at the moment. I'm wondering if you can either validate Sir Richard's POV there or uh, or add something to it or change it. What, what, what are your thoughts on that statement? I've met Richard before and, and I really like him. And uh, that is, uh, I think he's, I think he's fairly accurate. I, I, I will tell you a story and we don't, um, uh, Matthew McConaughey, the actor is coming out with this kind of a memoirs of his first 50 years. And I, I got to read a, he lives in Austin and I got to read a, uh, uh, the early version of the book and did an endorsement for it. And the thing that I love most about that book is Matthew wasn't an actor. I mean, Matthew was actually, he took some film and television uh, classes at the University of Texas and he thought he was going to be operating cameras. And he got, he went in this uh, movie was happening in Austin and he just asked, he got to play this bit role in this movie called Dazed and Confused. And uh, he kind of did a good job at it. And somebody asked him to go try out for something in L.A. And he did that. And and he never had any acting classes or anything like that. But he just got interested in acting. And, and in a lot of ways, he just started playing himself. And, you know, that's the easiest role to play is yourself. And, you know, look at him. He's one of the most famous actors in the world who, in a sense, just kind of followed an interest. And then it, it you, once you take... It's kind of hard to say this, but once you make a decision, I found that oftentimes things, serendipity starts to happen. Synchronicities begin to occur. You start meeting the right people. New doors open up. You've kind of put this intentionality out in the world and you start moving forward and other doors start opening. It's like you've begun an adventure and it takes you in surprising places. You can't always anticipate it. It, and I think that's a good way to think about it as an adventure. It's part of your life adventure. And uh, I wasn't trying to be an entrepreneur. I wasn't trying. I didn't. I just was interested in this, and I thought it would be fun. And then it. And then it. It, it grew. It, it grew into something that's been my life. And and. Uh, but I think it was because I just followed. My heart. You know, let me back up something. Th th this might actually be a key. So I started the story. I couldn't, you know, I had to start the story somewhere. But if I go back just a, a couple of years when I was about 20 years old and I was a student at University of Texas studying philosophy and I was trying, I was on track to get a philosophy degree and I hated this course I was taking. It was a required course. I didn't like it. I didn't like the professor. I didn't like the book. I didn't like the class. But I was torn, right, because I had to take this to get a degree. And, I, you know, my parents wanted me to get a degree. I didn't know what I would do with a degree in philosophy, but I was on a degree track. But I had this inner battle because part of me just said, don't read it. You're not interested in it. Don't do it. And I, well, you have to because you got you to buckle down and get this degree. So one day I was fighting, having an internal battle, and I stood up and I threw the book down on the ground. And I will – moderate my language a little bit here, but I said, I'm not going to read this frigging book. And, um, and the next day I dropped the class and my entire life changed at that point. It was like, okay, I'm not going to get a degree in philosophy. So from that point, I stopped reading books I wasn't interested in. I stopped taking classes I wasn't interested in. I started auditing classes, reading whatever I wanted to. I took control of my own life. It was my life now. My parents were upset. Where's their college degree? They, they cut me off. They didn't, they didn't pay for me anymore. So I had, to, I had to work, got jobs. But it was cheap to live in Austin back in the middle, early 70s. And I was now in control of my life. And I started doing what I wanted to do. And then soon after that, I moved into the vegetarian co-op. But I think the point is I stopped living my life the way everybody else told me I needed to be living it. And I started really doing what I wanted to do. 
that was really what changed everything for me. And then in some ways, moving into that vegetarian co-op was just an extension of me throwing that book down on the ground and saying, it's my life and I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to follow the things that I care about. That was, the liber- that, that was the liberating moment in my life. That changed everything. That is such a brilliant story. And part of what I b- believe is the real power there is your willingness to disappoint some people. And usually these are people that love us very much and, and whom we probably love back, right? These are, these are our parents and grandparents and peers and spouses and career counselors. And, and I'm wondering where did you sum up that courage and if you could, you know, share what was going through your mind right then? Was it just that this is my life and then that was enough? Or did you do yeah. some other rationalizing? So that's a very great question, Chase. So honestly, it was a very difficult decision. Because, and it really was my parents that when I thought about I have to get this degree, it's because I didn't want to disappoint my parents. And that was really the thing that was going on in my mind. And uh, I guess maybe it's because I was studying philosophy, but at a pretty early age, I, I don't it's kind of sound kind of weird. I got really clear about death. I was going to die. And most, we spend most of our lives in kind of denial of death because that's going to be way in the future. I'm young. I don't have to worry about that. But I sort of got really clear at about age 19 or 20. I am going to get old and sick and die. Oh my God, what am I going to do with my life? I don't even know if there's any life after death. I just know I'm going to die. So in that case, I'm going to make my life an adventure. I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm going to see where it takes me. I just took control of my life. And believe me, it was very hard. It was very hard to do that. You know, one of the, and I, one of the things I did soon after that was I, I said, I'm going to go on an adventure. I'm going to go hitchhiking across America. And so, oh, my God, my mother told me when I walked out of the door with my backpack in Houston, Texas, back in 1973 or something like that. She said, if you walk out of that door, you can never come back. And I will tell you, I hesitated. I thought, good God, my mother says, my mother, my very own mother says, I'm not ever welcome back in the house. And then I thought to myself, that is very manipulative. And if you really feel that way, if you really aren't going to welcome me back here just because I want to go hitchhiking across America, then fine. That's, I, I don't want to come back. But that was a very courageous act, and I did that. And uh, now that was actually that was slightly before I threw the book down on the ground, as so I just dropped out for a while. I was thinking I was a little bit younger, um, or as a, maybe a year younger than that. But the, that was the first time I rebelled in a big way against my parents. They were very unhappy about that. They thought I was going to get killed. Hitchhiking was dangerous. And, uh, and it was a grand adventure. I met the most interesting people hitchhiking around America. And then, but that, I guess maybe, I, you know, something you helped me put it together, that actually made it a lot easier for me to throw that book down and drop out because I realized that life's an adventure and uh, I want to learn as much as I can. I want to do as much as I can. I want to be alive. This was back in the era where, you know, you had like, uh, uh, you had Steppenwolf with their song, Born to be Wild, and it was a generation awakening them to themselves and I was part of it and, uh, um, yeah, I, I think back on those times with great memories, but I did take some courageous steps for me at that time. I did have to overcome mostly parental disapproval. That was my deepest fear. My parents would stop loving me, but I took, I, I was able to master it at the end of the day. I was able to master that fear and act. And I think a lot of people don't take charge of their lives because they're afraid, they're afraid of something afraid of rejection, afraid of failure, afraid that they're going to be hurt, afraid of, uh, of, of something. And uh, I guess I just had enough courage to, to face that fear and move forward anyway, even though I was scared. Believe me, hitchhiking across America, I was scared to death initially. I was just a kid. I was by myself, right? So, um, but you know what? It wasn't, I felt safe the whole time. I met really interesting people. I was getting invited to come over to people's houses and and people were pass, this is passing around marijuana all the time. And it was, uh, it was fun, a grand adventure. Well, you've got people from all over the world. Padel from Sydney, Ash Jensen loves the way you're thinking. AR is great. So grateful for our conversation today. Long Beach, New York. Billy is saying, 
so much gratitude for helping provide clarity and what he's feeling. Um, in short, again, global audience, I think what is so relatable about that is, look, we're social animals, right? We're social creatures and we want to connect and be a part of the tribe and be welcome around others that we love and that we hope love us back. But I, this is a thread that is so common in my conversations with people that are crazy successful and have lived the lives and um, followed their heart that, you know, such, such that so many folks want to emulate. And yet this, there's an unwillingness ultimately to betray others. And I feel like that is ultimately a willingness to betray ourself. And the, the question, the follow on question is, did you feel that, were you able to then reconcile this with your parents at some point? Oh yeah. Or it was that, and this is the, the silver lining is like, they might say that at the beginning, but if you go away and actually, you know, find or create fulfillment for yourself, there may be some reckoning. So tell, tell us that it worked out okay and you guys- oh, It, it, it okay. did work out okay. I mean, I think I hitchhiked for a couple of months and uh, I called home and my mother just said, I didn't mean any of that. I love you, please, please be safe. You're always welcome to come back home. So, and I did, I came back home and the prodigal came home and it was all fine. Um, and then again, I had to deal it again when I did drop out of school. Um, but my parents did love me. And even though they were, my mother was trying to manipulate me really through guilt, um, she did love me and she did accept it and we did reconcile. So, um, and I think maybe one of the reasons it made it a little easier for me is my parents were depression parents, right? They, they were born in the early 1920s and they, they, when their teenage years were in the depression, they got married young and then they, the world war two started. And my dad was in the military when he was 20 years old, I guess he was in, he was in the military in world war two. And, and then after that, they had they had their first child when they were very young, my sister, and uh, and they had all this responsibility. They just grew up really fast, and they and they and they sacrificed for their kids so much. And I always felt that my dad, I always felt sort of his support for me to go out and be a little bit more adventuresome because he wasn't able to do that, and so I always felt kind of sort of this tacit support from my dad. I never really felt it from my mom. I think she was very scared. She, uh, in fact, I'll tell you one other very personal story. This was uh, 1987. The last time I saw my mother was on her deathbed. And she was dying uh, and she'd had a stroke. And, and uh, it's the last time I ever saw her on the deathbed, she said, John, I want you to make one final promise to me before I die. And I said, well, sure. What, anything, mom, what do you, what do you want me to do? And she said, I want you to promise me that you'll stop doing this whole food stuff and you will go back to school and get your degree and make something of yourself and stop being a grocer. Your father and I gave you a fine mind and you were wasting it being a grocer. You could be so much more than, you could be a doctor, John. You could be a lawyer. You could be make a success of your life. Please do that for me. That's my dying wish. And, you know, oh I, I have a minor regret because to, I, I, didn't, I didn't lie to her because I think now what I wish I would have done is just a simple white lie to let my mother go to, to the grave in peace. I just said, you know what? I'm going to do that. But I didn't. I was young. I was in my early 30s. And Whole Foods was, was becoming successful, but she just wouldn't, she just thought it was a grocery store and it was so stupid. Hippie grocery store, that's what she thought it was. And I guess it kind of was, but it was becoming successful. I, I said, I'm not going back to school. I said, you know what, mom, I'm going to get an honorary degree someday. Someday, some university is going to honor me with a, with a doctorate. You'll see. And uh, that did happen. So I was able to fulfill that deathbed promise. But that that kind of spoke how my mother kind of was always trying to manipulate me in some ways through guilt. And uh, I just finally wised up to it and she stopped manipulating or I stopped letting her manipulate me. I think so, that's the right way of framing it, right? Yeah. It's because we are only, we're autonomous. We, we choose which way we move our arms and legs and what we think about. And, and, and yet the 
folks, especially people who we care about in our lives, that they have the opportunity to put those constraints on us, but we have to accept those constraints that's and accept absolutely those Absolutely correct. You're absolutely right. That's very brilliant. But it's 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 beautiful to hear your story because between the two of us here and the thousand or so people that are listening, that that is such a blocker for so many people. And the fact that you overcame that and and I feel like I may be putting something in your in your mouth now, but I'm going to ask you to respond to it. Was it based on values, what you saw in you know for you in your life, or or was it something else? It seems like you had a value of adventure, you had a value of independence and and of exploration. And and is it fair to say that you you started making decisions based on your values as a as a vehicle to to get away? It's, it's a, such a good question, and I, I can only, you know, I'm trying to recapture that feeling tone that of back in those days. I'm going to go back a long ways. I mean, I think it was part of the generation that I was part of. I'm a baby boomer, and this is the counterculture that's burgeoning in the in the late 60s and early 70s, and I'm very feeling that energy, the, the rock and roll you're listening to, the animals wrote a song called It's My Life and I'll Do What I Want To. There was a lot of that rebellion against the the values and mores of our parents, and it was like we're a new generation, and we're you know enter the young was another song and that the association did, and there were so many songs that you know I mean young people are very much influ influenced by their music, the musicians, the the poets they read, and and uh, their friends and their peers, and there was a there was a super energy back then about. Um, we can make this society better and rejecting a lot of what our parents were doing. I mean, the society was very racist back then, for example, and far more racist back in the 60s and 70s than it is today in America. And there was... Um, and we're still not there yet, clearly. No, of right? course not. Yeah. Of course not. And there was... We had a Vietnam War going on. That was, of course, the biggest instigator that we didn't... To rebel against that, to rebel against war, re rebel against dr a draft that was taking us to fight in, a, in another country and kill people we had no beef with. Um, so that was all part of that that sort of era and that and and that's all influencing you. You know, you're just a young person confused. But you ask about the values. And I think the most important value was that it's my life. And I want to do what I want to do, not what other people want me to do. And there was just this passion and determination to make the most I could make out of my life and take control of it. And, and that's really the, 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 the dominant value back then at that age. I'm very young. I'm not that same person now, although there's the, that root of it still there, but I've, I've developed and grown and, and I'm a very, I'm, you know, it's a much different person than I was when I was in my very early twenties. Well, this idea of values, what you said a bunch of times and what I know about, of course, uh, your new book. And which is conscious leadership. If you're just now joining, I'm here with John Mackey, founder uh, of Whole Foods. And this, what I know again about about your life and what I've read is a concept of um, treating business and and leadership with care and and uh, commitment and love. You use the word love a bunch, passion and love and positivity and integrity. These are words that are regularly a part of your vocabulary, all the interviews that I've watched. And, and I'm wondering if you could, you know, maybe this is a leap, but we're going from values and the things that were embedded in our, you know, early decisions and for you to start the grocery store and to, you know, go hitchhiking and do things that your parents didn't want you to do. But are, what role did, did love and integrity play in, you deciding to start the grocery store and what role do they still play for you today? So oh, these are spiritual experiences that have occurred over, over my lifetime. And to a certain extent, I don't, I don't want to share some of them. They're very deeply personal and, uh, I, I don't, cause I'm, I'm sort of, I'm a little bit well known. I don't want some of this stuff to be out in the media and how it can be twisted and misinterpreted. So I'm going to be a little bit careful here, but I have had several sort of profound 
what I would call spiritual awakenings in my lifetime. And without a doubt, the most important awakening is the awakening to love. Love is the most important thing in life. When we get to the end of our lives, we're not going to be thinking. I'm not going to be thinking, boy, I wish I'd worked a little bit harder at Whole Foods Market. I wish I'd made a little bit more money. It's going to be about relationships. It's going to be about love. It's going to be about the people that I've loved. It's going to be about the people that I maybe hurt and that I have regrets, and hopefully I will have healed all that uh, before I before I die. I think I largely have because I've made it great efforts to do so. And I just think that is by far, if people want to know the meaning of life, in my mind, there's no question what the meaning of life. The meaning of life is love. That is the most important thing. And I just was very fortunate that I discovered that at a reasonably young age. And there's not enough love in our planet right now. There's not enough love in America. We're each other's throats. There's not enough love in business. It's in the corporate closet. And love is needs to be released and you can't release it when people are so frightened fear is the great enemy of love because we we we're scared and we want to we want to be safe and uh, right now people are so scared this pandemic has got people scared and we have a lot of protest a lot of anger and we've got a got a lot of cancel culture stuff going on that scares people and um, it's a very fearful time and so there, with fear, there's a lot less love being manifested. And we need to lead with love. That's why we made that the second chapter of our book, Lead with Love. Why check love at the door in corporations? It's, I'm not talking about romantic love. I'm not talking about uh, sexual love. I'm talking about those are probably maybe best left at the, at the, when you check in at the corporation. It doesn't get you in trouble. But the love of really caring about people and helping people and being generous and compassionate and caring and, and practicing forgiveness, gratitude. These are, these are what make us human. These are the things that give us the most lasting satisfaction in life, the love of our families, the love of our children, the love of our friends, the love of our colleagues at work. And, you know, th without a doubt, when people ask me, well, why have you been doing this for 42 years? Yes, I have a strong sense of purpose with Whole Foods and foods we sell, but that's not really the real driver at this point are the relationships that I've had with the people that I've built this company with. I just love people at Whole Foods. I love our team members. I love my team here in Austin. Um, when you do things it's kind of like Marines kind of feel, I think. They have this deep bonding with people that, that they, you know, they go through an intense experience. Well, building a business is an intense experience. And uh, I just am madly in love with so many people at Whole Foods Market that we're still hanging out and doing stuff together. And uh, um, that's probably more than anything else that's kept me hanging around for so long. And I do think you can lead with love, and I do think Whole Foods Market has a tremendous amount of love that's been released in it, that we are – we do a lot of things like appreciations at the end of our meetings. We do lots of rituals and practices that release love. Love is – I was just going to say, can you, can you share – you just rattled off a couple, but I think it's so important for people who – because, as you said, love is sort of in the corporate closet. and. Right. What are some manifestations of those in the workplace? And this could be true for you when you're listening right now, whether it's just you working with your vendors or collaborators or co-conspirators, but it also can be if you're a leader of a company of 10 or 100 or, or 10,000. What are some ways that sure. you feel like you brought love into the workplace in a way that, uh, as you said earlier, doesn't get you in trouble, but is, is also inspirational and connecting and all the, the best sides of love that we, we can uh, bring to, bring to be, bear? Yeah. So one way to uh, love is an emotion, but I think in this context, what I'm trying to get you to think about is love is really a skill. It's something you have to practice if you want to get good at it. And one of the practices you need that we do at Whole Foods, which is this, if you got nothing else out of this talk, but you remember this one thing I'm about to tell you and began to do it in your own organizations, you would find that it would release love. They would take it out of the closet. We we finish our meetings at Whole Foods with appreciations. They're voluntary. Nobody has to do them. We simply appreciate 
the people that we work with, the people that are in that room, or some other team member that 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 we know that has done something we think really deserves to be called out and appreciated. And what I have found, and what we have found, is that they're voluntary. They have to be authentic. People know when you're just you know, blowing smoke. They know when you're really authentically appreciating, but it's impossible to authentically appreciate somebody without opening your heart. And when you open your heart, you are sharing love through that appreciation. And that the person that's getting appreciated, it's amazing. I don't know how many times I had thought maybe I had a bad relationship with somebody and then they, they lay this big appreciation on me and I know it's genuine and I know they love me. I feel it. I never think about them the same way again. I don't judge them any longer. I don't, the petty stuff that we do, it just disappears because it's like, wow, she's amazing. I had no idea that she could cared about me that in that way. And, um, and so friends, friends for life, as far as I'm concerned, but the, the biggest beneficiary from an appreciation is when you do it yourself, because to do an authentic appreciation is to open your heart and let love flow out of it. And so when you're doing this with your team, it, everybody's connecting and bonding. And in fact, at Whole Foods, sometimes we have to cut appreciations off because we get in this sort of love in and we, we've had times where I've actually timed it where we did appreciations for a couple hours and it's like, okay, they have got to do some work here. So <laughs> we're going to let, we started limiting you to three appreciations. You can only appreciate three people. And then even that was too long. So we said, look, choose wisely you get one appreciation here so make it a good one but that's all you get is one take the other appreciations and do them in private with people not in public so we can get focused back on the business it's very very powerful and it's very easy to do it's not rocket science and if you're the leader you're the one that has to do it you have to embody it because you have to give per other permission to do it so you can't just talk about it. You got to be the leader of the appreciations. But if you do, you will be releasing love in your organization and it'll spread and it'll grow. Well, that is a, I love the, the tactical aspect of it. And I think we've all either been a part of a team or a movement or uh, been in a situation where when you're, as you said, business is a, is a, is, is hard, right? It's, you go through things that you aren't going to go through with people that you probably are at with home or at a home. And, and, um, I think this connection that as a leader, you can demonstrate, um, lead by example. I think those are, are, it's just very, very wise. And, and if you are in a position where you've had this experience with a team or something that you've been on, what would it be like? I want you to ask yourself, what would it be like if you brought that into your workplace or, and inspired your, team or employees or coworkers or collaborators. Um, John, go ahead. I, I think you wanted to say something. I want to yeah. say one other thing. I want to say one other practice that you can do that's completely transformative for yourself. And it's so easy to do and you can do it every day and I do it every day. So it's practicing gratitude. If you practice gratitude, I almost guarantee you, you're going to be happy. If you want more happiness in your life, practice gratitude. And the reason people are so unhappy is because people start to be worried about their problems, the challenges they have. And when you start obsessing about that, your consciousness contracts down on yourself and on your problems. And it's easy to adopt kind of a victim narrative. And then you're not happy. But when you practice gratitude, you break out of that trap. You, you, you're expanding. And gratitude is so easy because there's such... To, the simplest gratitude you can practice is just simply the amazement of being alive. How amazing is it to be alive? There's so much beauty in the world. There's so much to learn. Nature's incredible. We get to taste and touch and see and hear and move. We get to love. We get to have friends. We get to do things that may make a difference in the world. And it's such a gift because it's so brief. It's so amazing to be alive. And so I start my day off, honestly, when I first get up, I start off with a gratitude practice. And then I do a meditation. And then I'm kind of, I'm in a good space for the day because I'm, I've got my heart open and I'm ready to get going. So you can practice gratitude in the morning. You can practice it before you eat a meal. 
it doesn't have to be a big deal. Do it for 15 or 20 seconds. It's not a huge burden. But if you do an authentic gratitude exercise or if you share it with your family, it's a great thing for children to do. It's a great thing to go around and have the kids tell you what they're grateful for in that day. It's a great practice for them. It, your life's going to change. You're going to be happier because you're going to have your consciousness wider and open wider. So practice gratitude. It doesn't take much time and it will transform your life. I love that. That is a, a through thread to so many of the important conversations we've had on this show over the, the 10 years. There's a consistent, like some sort of a meditation or mindfulness and or, or gratitude practice. That is a very common thread. And I love, thank you for sharing that you do that first thing in the morning. And I do love the idea of asking the kids and your family, or it's an amazing exercise when you're out to dinner with some friends and just want to interrupt the meal for a second and say how thankful you are and just go around the table for it yeah. is a, it's a beautiful, as, uh, I think you're, you know, this came out of our conversation about love and connection, and all the things that you want for your business. But I want to connect this. What, what is clear to me, John, about your work is the, um, the connection that you have with your humanity and then what you've done to bring that to business. There's a, there's a line in, in uh, some of your work, elevating business through humanity and elevating humanity through business. I was hoping you can dissect that a little bit and share with us what that means to you. That's the subtitle of the book. So it's conscious leadership, elevating humanity through business. And I don't think people appreciate how much business has elevated humanity. Business has a negative narrative that it's selfish and greedy, exploitative. But if you look back, if you look at the history of the last 200 years, 200 years ago, 85% of everyone alive, these are easy data to check, 85% of everyone alive lived on less than $1 a day. The average lifespan was 30, and 90% of the people alive on the planet Earth were illiterate. It has been business. It has been capitalism that has really literally lifted people out of the dirt. Business is elevating humanity. However, so much of that's been done in an unconscious way. And so there have been there also been some unintended negative consequences as well. As we see those today, that there's like in some environmental damage. There's been there's obviously there's still inequality on this planet. We can be more conscious. And if we are more conscious as leaders, we can elevate humanity with less of the unintended negative consequences that occur when we are blundering around unconscious. So that's why that's the subtitle of the book. Conscious leadership is elevating humanity. I could say elevating humanity through leadership, but that just doesn't sound as catchy when your title is conscious leadership. <laughs> but, but that's really what we're trying to say, that we need more conscious leaders. We need them everywhere. We need them in business. We need them in politics. We need them in government. We need them in healthcare. We need them in education. We need them in the media. We need them everywhere. And that is a, a subtext that I took from the the PDF that you sent over the early edition of the book, which is leaders are everywhere. And there are people right now, you might not be thinking of yourself as a leader, and yet you're at the helm of your solopreneur journey. You're a leader, maybe it's of one, but you're leading your product or your company or your, and this idea of looking around for leaders, sure, you can do that, but if not you, who, right? And, and there's this transferable understanding that we are all leaders of something, whether it's a family or a business or whatever. And I just appreciated that leadership in the way that you talk about it is not just Fortune 500 CEOs. So I'm wondering if you can, um, you know, in in writing the book Conscious Leadership, help me understand how someone who is um, listening or watching right now, they have zero employees, and maybe it's this person who I said earlier was locked in, or they're they're in in their basement in Ohio in their underwear, and like, what am I, you know, how, how can I? advance humanity? What am I leading? I'm not leading anything. What would you say to that person who has that view of their, their, uh, their life? Do you know what the hardest leadership act we'll ever do in life is? No, share Le it with us. Leading ourself. That's the hardest. If we can lead ourselves, until we can lead ourselves, we can't really lead anybody else <laughs> or we shouldn't be 
because what kind of leader are we going to be? We have to begin our leadership journey by first leading ourselves and committing ourselves to being a better human being, to being more loving, to have a sense of purpose, to, to have integrity, to seek win-win-win solutions. These are, and so it's a journey that we are each on to lead ourselves. That's the first and hardest journey we'll ever take. And if we can master that, then maybe we will be fit to help lead other people. So you don't have to be a Fortune 500 leader, but you know what? You'll never be a good one if you yourself can't lead yourself. And I, most of the people that I've seen fail at leadership and over the, the years were people that were, were really screwed up. They just never got their own stuff together, so they, they eventually self-destruct. They basically commit kind of leadership suicide because they didn't, they didn't understand their motivations, their emotions. They didn't develop emotional intelligence. They never mastered fear. They, they couldn't hold their anger in check when it was appropriate. And so they, they were bouncing all over the place with inappropriate actions and motivations and, and emotions. So first and hardest is to lead ourselves. And so everybody listening to this, that's the challenge I'll put to you. Can you lead yourself? And are you committed to doing that? Do you have the commitment to, to do that? And so, um, oh, I love it. I love it. And there's, you've said a couple of things that I also want to tie together. One is this concept of win, win, win. And then you also talked about the sort of stigma. I'll use that word maybe loosely, the stigma that business has for being cutthroat or, um, undermining or, or ignorant to the impacts of some of the decisions or choices that businesses make. But in, you know, your previous book and in this one, this idea that business isn't uh, cutthroat, that it can be, as you say, win, win, win. What, what do you mean by that? First of all, competition is greatly exaggerated in business. Competition is part of business, but most of the people that are trading with the business, let's take Whole Foods, for example, you know, our customers could care less about competition. They just want to get good food. And our team members, they don't care about competition. They just want to, they're having a job that, that, and they want to serve people. Our suppliers are the same way. They just want to sell us food that we put on our shelves and we sell it to our, uh, sell it to our customers. Uh, it's only the senior leadership that's obsessed with competition in most organizations. The great majority of people, customers, employees, suppliers, even investors, they don't, uh, the whole competition thing is part of business. But it's not the essence of business. Bus the essence of business is creating value for other people. That's what it's about. And, and uh, so the whole competition thing is a narrative that is that is uh, gotten out of control. It's like uh, it's like a Frankenstein monster that's completely out of control and not really. Uh, you can't really understand business thinking about it and primarily in terms of those metaphors. But the, the competitive metaphors keep love from being in the marketplace because if you're at war or you're in a survival game, a Darwinian survival of the fittest, then you don't really have much of a place for, for love. But let me talk a little bit about finding win-win-win uh, solutions because one of the frameworks that people have about life and about business as you say, it's cutthroat competition, but they also have kind of a binary. They think them through. It's um, with these polar with these polarities. Like it's win lose. If somebody wins, somebody else is losing. Or if somebody's getting rich, somebody else is getting poor. If there's somebody's good, then there's evil to counterbalance it. There's light. There's darkness. There are these opposites. But business isn't really a win lose proposition. It's actually a win-win-win proposition because all of the people that are exchanging with business, all of the major stakeholders are, are trading with the business voluntarily. So customers win. When I use again Whole Foods as an example. Our customers come in, they trade with Whole Foods. Nobody's making them be there. They're there because our particular combination of quality, service, food, atmosphere, and price meets their standard. And so they are shopping with us at least that day. Uh, and they're gaining from that or they wouldn't do it. They're winning. The people working for us, our team members, they're working for us because at this particular time in their lives, this is the best job they can find at the rate of pay, the quality of the experience, 
the overall atmosphere, the learning, the opportunities, they choose to work there. Nobody's forcing them to. It's the best job they can find right now. They're winning or they wouldn't be there. The suppliers, the tens of thousands of suppliers that Whole Foods trades from all over the world, they we don't force them to trade with us. They trade with us. We come to an agreement on prices. We negotiate. It's a win for us. It's a win for them. Same with our when investors when we were before Amazon bought us. We were a public company and we were private before that. Nobody had to buy our stock. They bought it because they liked the company and they thought the stock would go up. And if they didn't like it, they could sell their stock. They were winning too. So everybody's making these exchanges with business and it's not a win-lose. Customers win, team members win, suppliers win, investors win, and the communities that we're part of are winning as well. Business is fundamentally a game of win, 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 win. And it's so misunderstood because they think about it in win-lose framework because people have a win-lose framework. Business needs to be reconceptualized. The narrative needs to be changed. That's what stakeholder theory is trying to do. But stakeholder theory is misunderstood. It's put back in a win-lose framework. Oh, at last, the investors are going to lose. They get too much money. And we're going to take the money from them. We're going to redistribute it to the workers or to the customers or to somebody else, the social responsibility uh, the communities, but the investors, investors are going to lose. But it rightly thought about in stakeholders, you're developing strategies where all the stakeholders are winning, including the investors. They're not profit is not bad. Profit's good. Profit's how the economy advances. It's how we make progress. It's how we innovate. Profit is absolutely essential for that. So the idea that profit is somehow their exploitation or evil is wrong. It's based on voluntary exchange for mutual gains. And profit is what makes the system progress. So business is fundamentally good. It's, and it can make, if it's conscious, we can make it even better. We can make it even better. At every level, we can make it better by being more conscious. So we need win-win-win thinking um, in our society, Chase, because uh, th think about this. Our society is at it's our throats right now. We have these, it's the most divisive it's probably been since the Civil War. We desperately need win, win, win thinking. We need it in our government. We need it in politics. We need to seek the higher ground so that we can find ways to every, all Americans to win so that we can, everybody can go along and take this upward ride and no one should be excluded. But we need to start thinking in terms of win, win, win instead of win, lose. And we're still caught in that dichotomy. And we need to move past it if America is going to heal up and go further. And we need, we need conscious leaders in these different areas of life that can show the way upward. And frankly, that's one of the reasons we wrote the book and part of why I'm talking with you today is because I'm trying to inspire people to start thinking that way. If we get enough people thinking that way, we will get out of this trap that we are currently in. We desperately need to get out of this trap. So well said. And as I open with, it's just incredibly well timed. And and having written books myself, I know how long they take. So kudos to you for seeing around the corner for this. There's another part of your thinking that that has inspired me, and I'm hoping you can share the role that it's played for you, and in turn inspire um, so many people listening today. And that is the role of long term. How? So many of us can't afford or we tell ourselves a story that we can't afford to think long term because, hey, I got bills to pay or I got, you know, the the um, the taxes are due or whatever reason. But help us understand the role that long long term thinking has played in your success and how you would coach uh, anyone listening to to think in that long term way. Well, the one thing to realize is that right now. In this moment, we're living what used to be in the past, the long term. Both the good and the bad are based on decisions that occurred in the past that have led us to this particular moment. And I guess I got into learn long term thinking a long time ago. And I think partly it is easier for a retailer because Whole Foods Market always has to sign leases for property that usually 20 year leases with options that go on for another 20 years, 20 or 30 years. So we're signing, we're committing to rent a property for a minimum of 20 years. And so we got to be very careful about that because we don't, if you get a bad location, you're going to be stuck with it and you're going to be paying this rent for a long, long time. And I remember the first time I signed a long-term, a long-term lease, it was in our, before that were mostly five-year leases. 
that when we went to Palo Alto, California, we signed our first 20-year lease. And I remember thinking about it. I guess I was about, how old was I back then? I was about mm, 30, 34, 35, something like that. And, and I remember thinking, oh my God, 20 years. We're going to sign this lease for 20 years. That seems so long away. That seems so long ago. And we'll never get there. And, uh, and then I remember when we passed that 20 year lease back in, I guess, 2008 or 2009. And, uh, I thought, oh my God, Palo Alto lease, it's, it's expiring. We have to, <laughs> use, we have to renew it. We have to get new options for it. We had to negotiate new options for it. And then even those options have expired because we've been in that store now for 31 years and that, and that's been a great location for us. It was a huge location when we got it. Now it's one of the smallest locations in the company. So we had to think long term. So it became easier for us. And but the reality is thinking and you know, I'm very happy to be part of Amazon in the sense that Jeff Bezos and Amazon have always thought really a long term. They've always they plan at least 10 years into the future and sometimes longer than that. And uh, so it's been I've I've really admired their ability to do that consistently. It's hard as a public company. You're under a lot of short term profit pressures. Whole Foods always felt those short term profit pressures to make the quarter so the stock doesn't get killed. And and Amazon's always been able to to resist that temptation. So I think that's that's just, I think a lot about their ability to think long term and Jeff Bezos ability to think long term. But in life. The decisions we make, the habits that we do today will determine how we, how we do tomorrow. For example, if you want to be, if you want to retire with money, you have to start saving money. And you, and it, you know what? It's not that hard to save money. You just, you just have to pay yourself first. Take the first 10% of what you earn and save it and invest it. And you say, oh, I can't afford to save 10% of my money. Well, you know what? Of course you can, because you used to live on 10% less money than you have right now. You used to live on less money. So you, you can, because you used to. And someday you'll be making more money than you're making right now. But the, what, what we tend to do in America is we ratchet up our spending to whatever uh, money we earn. And all it takes is a simple decision to think long term is I'm going to save 10% of my income the rest of my life. Whatever I make, I'm just going to pay myself first. The first 10% goes into those savings. And the power of compounding is so amazing. By the time you get to, I guarantee you, if you do that, do the math and do the power of compounding. If you start doing that when you're in your early 20s, by the time you get to be in your 60s, you're going to be a millionaire. That's just the simple power of compounding. If you put that in a, an index fund, a Vanguard index fund, and let it compound, by the time you get to be in your 60s, you're going to be quite wealthy. Um, and you can prove it if you just do the, do the math. And we should be teaching people that, by the way. We should be teaching that in our high schools and our colleges because very few people understand that. And it would be transform people's lives if they did. Another example of thinking long term is your own health. If we make investments in our health in terms of our rest, our sleep, we have a chapter on that in the book called Regularly Revitalize. And if we will practice those type of habits, rest, movement, healthy diet, we are, our bodies are going to be incredibly vital and healthy when we get older. And if we don't do that, they're going to break down. Most people are, very few people actually make the investment in their long-term health. But it's the smartest thing you can do because really at the end of the day, it's not how long you live, it's the quality of your life while you're alive. And when we're healthy, when we're vital, when our bodies are functioning well, there's just sort of this inner joy that you feel in being alive. And you don't want to lose that. So you have to take care of it. And you have to think long term about your health and your body. Our, so, our last, that's yeah. brilliant, brilliant thinking, John. Our, the last guest we had on the show, what James Clear, the New York Times bestselling author of Atomic Habits, um, he said the problem with uh, short-term thinking, it tends to make us feel really good. It's like, am I going to eat this cookie? It's sweet and it tastes good. <laughs> and we, it, and yet it has long-term negative effects. So these short-term wins tend to have long-term negative effects. And if you can just like flip this, this reward mechanism to 
a longer term award and maybe eat kale instead of the cookies. It's just amazing how some of these things that are the, the best things in life really take time. And, you know, you, you, you cited Bezos. Now you're, you know, your new owner, um, new ish, I guess, depending on uh, what new means to you. But, uh, the, he, what I, one of the things I appreciated about his long-term thinking, and I'm curious what role this played for you, is I think he said you have to be willing to be misunderstood for long periods of time in order to truly do something great. And I'm wondering, is that a role that you had to uh, negotiate with, with your mom, for example, who thought you had a little hippie grocery store? and you were willing to be misunderstood clearly because you know here you are 40 years later this september uh and and still doing the thing that you did then and and obviously have created not just a lot of wealth for yourself and your shareholders but you've impacted so many areas of life and you talked about good food for folks so what role succinctly here you know what role has um thinking long term played for you in 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 business, for example, or in being willing to do something that could have very powerful long term, say, compounding effects like the money you talked about, but but in business. You know, it's it's kind of a way of thinking. It's just like finding win, win, win solutions is a way of thinking. Um, leading with love is a way of thinking. And so is thinking long term. That is also a way of being in the world. And there's a great couple of great stories about Warren Buffett that are that you know there's a guy that really thought long has thought long term. And Buffett really saw the power of compounding over long periods of time. So whenever he would spend money, because he had a brilliant mind and he could he could do compounding in his head, he didn't think he was like. Uh, He's just buying lunch. He would calculate out, well, this lunch actually in in 25 years that I'm spending this $10 on lunch and in 25 years, that's going to be worth $15,000 if I, if I invested instead of eating the lunch. And that's a very powerful habit to be thinking about, okay, I could, this Starbucks coffee I'm drinking, if I was to not drink it and I save this money and it compounded, what would it be worth in a certain period of time? That could turn you into a miser and you never spend any money, but it is a fruitful way to think. And it's also interesting to think, I just read this recently and it's kind of a statistic that I'm still getting my head around. I read recently that Warren Buffett, for example, he made 90% of his net worth right now happen after he turned 65. That's wow. the power of count compounding over a long period of time. Wow. And also the power of living a long time. Warren Buffett's, I think, 89 or 90 now. So, <laughs> But it's a framework. It's a way of thinking. And we don't think that way. You're absolutely right. We think about the short-term pleasure, and we don't think about the long-term consequences. But I think that's where habits are so important. Because you take food, for example. What, one thing I learned that was very important, because when I was a kid, I ate junk food and I didn't eat healthy food. I, I, it took me a long time to learn to eat healthily. But one thing I did learn is that whatever food you eat, you will come to like. All you got to do is expose your palate to it about 10 times or so, and you'll start to like it. I taught myself to love every vegetable. I love vegetables. I didn't eat any vegetables when I was a kid. I hated them all. They were vegetables. They were boring. I wanted... You know, I wanted hamburgers and French fries and chocolate shakes and fried chicken uh, and cookies, chocolate chip cookies in particular. <laughs> so I learned that you might as well teach yourself to eat the healthiest food in the world because you're going to love it once your palate gets used to it. I don't have any loss in pleasure. I, I promise you, I probably enjoy eating them anybody you have on this call and I eat just super healthy food. I've just taught myself. I re-educated my taste buds. It didn't even take that long. And so you can teach yourself to love any food. Why not teach yourself to love the foods that are going to nourish you right back and give you not only no loss in short, there's won't be any loss. There won't be any loss in pleasure because your palate will evolve, but there's a tremendous payback in long-term health. So that's a challenge I'll put to the listeners. Why not teach yourself to eat the healthiest food in the world? You won't lose pleasure in the long run. You're going to gain pleasure and you're going to gain health and longevity. It's a great trade-off. And there is no trade-off in the long run. The last thing 
that I want to cover. I think you, you you touched on one thing that I had a, a, a big star next to in my notes for this, and that is taking care of yourself. You've talked about it through exercise and moving your body, and we got to it through through long term, and of course, um, food. And in a way, it's related to. Uh, so I feel like we 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 traversed that ground, but I want to you know bring that along to this last bit, which is service. Being in service, whether it's to your stakeholders or to, you know, the mission or vision that you have for your life or company, I want to know what, what service means to you, because I think that's a pretty like fuzzy term for a lot of people. So how do you define it and how has it been important in your journey? Service is, um, I mean, I'm Albert Schweitzer, one of my heroes who won the Nobel Peace Prize in, I don't know, 1970 or something like that. He's long been passed, but was an amazing guy. And, and I'm not going to tell his biography because I take, you don't have the time to do it. But Schweitzer said, and I, unfortunately, I can't remember the quote perfectly. So I'll be, you know, but I, he basically said, the only ones of you who will, tr- will know true happiness are those who have found how to serve others. And that is a profound statement. And I don't know if it's completely true or not, but I will tell you that service is deeply rewarding when you do it from a heart that wants to serve, meaning a heart that wants to love. And here's the paradox that it that I'm going to tell you, but and I'm going to try to explain it, but some people will get it right away and others will have to puzzle on it. It's sort of a truth, it's a deep truth, the deep spiritual truth, that whatever you give to others, you give to yourself first. Because the act of giving, authentic giving, there's a heart opening that goes along with it to truly give. And so in a sense, you are giving to yourself when you give to someone else. So we tend to think if we give something, there's this loss. There's this trade-off. They got what I have. Now I don't have it, so I've lost and they've gained. Except that the act of giving is this hard opening, authentic giving, not guilt giving or dutiful giving, but giving out of generosity, a generous spirit. You have to open your heart to do that. And when you do that, you're in a sense giving to yourself first. So and giving and receiving are actually one and the same. Service is the same way. When we give service, truly give it, not again out of guilt or duty, but because we want to, because we want to serve others. There is this opening that nourishes ourself at a deep level. And so that's why Schweitzer says, those of you that have truly learned how to serve are the ones that will truly be happy because service opens the heart and there's the flow of love and love is creates happiness. So that's, that's my paradoxical truth for you here. And service is, yes, I believe in service. I have to be in service. There are things that I have to do because if I don't do them, I won't be happy. (laughs) I've got all else to put it. I have to serve because I, I know that if I don't, I'm going to be deeply unhappy and deeply dissatisfied. So it's a paradox because somebody could say, well, you're just serving. You're serving selfishly. Think about that. You're just serving to make yourself happy. And it's sort of true, except it's not selfish if you're giving to another. But it's a win-win. Yeah. It's no longer binary. It's a win for them and it's a win for me. And that's not self-sacrifice because in the giving and in the service, I am benefiting tremendously from doing so. And they're benefiting too. That's perfect. Well, uh, lessons in life and business is what I'm going to probably call this talk when we publish this on <laughs> the audio version because I feel like we've gone to school here, John. And I want to thank you. There's la- I said it was the last question, but uh, I-, I always wanted to eke one more in here. And it's it's emerged as you were talking because you – you just said as an example, like, I know that about myself, I need to do this in order to be happy. And let's go back to the beginning to you walking out of your parents' house and going to hitchhike, 
you knew that you had to do that. And that was a calling and you were willing to ostensibly turn your back on your own family in order to be able to do that. So it's a, I think it was Socrates that said, know thyself. I'm just curious, what has your personal journey been on around self-awareness? Are there some particular practices that you would suggest? Um, how important has that been to you? And it's clearly, you know, enmeshed in the fabric of, of your life, yes. knowing who you are, what makes you tick. Is there any advice that you could give to our listeners about how you've done that and how they might think about a constructive framework for doing it for themselves? Um, meditation, self-reflection. Uh, most people do not understand what motivates them. They don't understand their emotions. They don't understand why they do what they do. So we have to pay attention and we have to be able to reflect upon what we're doing. And we have to be able to quiet the mind chatter. We have a thought stream that goes on continuously. And we're most people, most of the time, I mean, we get lost in it. And we're no longer in the present moment. It's in the present moment that love exists. It's in the present moment that we connect truly with others. But we can't connect while we're lost in our mind stream. We have to be able to quiet the mind down. And here's another thing. When we quiet our mind down, we will find that there's a deeper, quieter voice that's whispering to us inside our own being. And that quiet voice is our deeper self. It's our heart. It is the love that wants to show up in the world. But we can't hear it most of the time because the, the mind chatter is drowning it out. But once we begin to quiet the mind chatter, we begin to connect up with that deeper, quiet voice that can be our life guide that's guiding us to do the right thing, guiding us to love others, guiding us to make good choices for ourselves. And ultimately, that's been my secret, really. I got in touch with that vo quiet little voice when I was younger, and I lose it sometimes because I get afraid or I, I start doing things that are that aren't, you know, I'm, I get out of touch with it, but I always find my way back to it again. I mean, the best way to find it back is to try to quiet that, quiet the noisy thoughts in your mind and just be present in the moment. Be here now, be in the moment. In the moment, the voice is clear. In the moment, there is love, but we have to be in the moment. And that sounds easy. It isn't easy to be in the moment. It's the hardest thing we can do, right? <laughs> Presence is like, well, Ram Das, be here now. Like that's he spent a, a lifetime trying to be in presence, right? Yes, but you know what? It's something we practice, and the more we practice it, the better we get at it. It's a skill we develop, and uh, there's no easy way to do this stuff. We have to do the work. We have to do the practices, and if we do, the rewards are tremendous. Awesome, John. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. I want to say congratulations um, and encourage anyone who's listening, watching, to um, get a copy of your new book, Conscious Leadership, Elevating Humanity Through Business. I read Conscious Capitalism, really enjoyed it. And this also is uh, a new chapter, and it's so well-timed. And, and to be clear again, John's not talking about leadership being out there and others we need people to rise up from whoever you are you're leading someone even if it's yourself as you said earlier so i want to say thank you for being on the show um any particular coordinates we want to point to uh out there in the world that you want people's attention focused on clearly the book is something that you're uh excited to share anything else that you'd want uh, us or people listening or watching to know about um Just try to move past your fear and be in the moment and love other people because America need we need we've got to get pat we're stuck we got to get we got to move on and we do that we're going to do it through waking up and loving more not through hate not through attacking not through fear not through judgment but through truly connecting back into our own personal higher purpose and to follow our heart and to love and to seek win 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 solutions it's it's why I wrote the book. I hope you read it. Thank you so much, Ash and Barbara and MK and Timothy and Saif and Tony and Todd. So many people from around the world thanking you for our conversation today. And for those of you listening at some point in the future in your headphones, it's been an honor to be in your ears. John, thank you so much for being on the show and uh, 
congrats and, and continued success to you. Thanks, Chase. I've really enjoyed our conversation. You're a pretty amazing guy. I appreciate Pre it very much. Thank you so much, John. And signing off to everybody listening, we'll stay tuned till the next episode. Until then, don't forget John's book and be well. All right. 